After classes, Margot was studying in the library. At one point, she left for the bathroom. When the girl returned, she found out her wallet was gone. Margot immediately called the police. The librarian said she'd seen some guy, but she had poor eyesight and couldn't remember what he looked like. After listening to her vague description, the police officers questioned three students. Owen said he had been studying and hadn't even left his desk until the police arrived. Finn said he'd seen the girl but never really paid attention to her. He was looking for some books. Lucas said he'd been busy talking to his friend on the phone. He hadn't seen anything. Can you figure out who stole the wallet? It was Luca. He said he'd been talking on the phone, but it's prohibited in the library. If he had used his phone, he'd have been immediately kicked out. So he's lying. During a casual walk deep in the forest, Esme got lost. After hours of wandering, she saw a witch's house. Esme asked the elderly woman to show her the way back. The witch refused, but she was in a good mood and offered a deal. She gave Esme three apples. Two of them were poisoned, and one was okay to eat. The girl had to pick one apple and bite into it. If she didn't get poisoned, the witch would show her the way home. Esme was a smart girl and managed to do it. How did she know which apple to pick? In one apple, there was a worm which means it was safe to eat. A student was having an exam and he was about to fail it. The professor decided to give him one more chance and asked the last question. It was, what's my oldest daughter's name? The student was puzzled. The professor decided the question was too hard and gave the guy a hint. He wrote down three numbers, 58, 3, and 11. Can you help the student answer the question? It's a chemistry class. The riddle must be related to the subject. Have a look at the periodic table. The 58th element is cerium, or CE. The third element is lithium, LI. And the 11th element is sodium, or NA. If you put all of them together, you'll get the name Selena. The professor liked the game. When another student was struggling with his task, he gave him another puzzle. The man said, I have daughters. All of them, except two, have dark hair. All of them, except two, have blonde hair. And all of them, except two, have red hair. How many daughters do I have? Can you help the student out? This time, the riddle has nothing to do with chemistry. Pure logic. The professor has three daughters. One of them has dark hair, the second is blonde, and the third daughter has red hair. Ben was walking in the park at night when someone knocked him out and stole all his stuff. The guy went to the police. Three people, Cole, Jerry, and Bernard, were in the park at that time. They got arrested. The detective gave each of them a marker and asked them to write their names on the whiteboard. As soon as they finished, he immediately arrested the right person. Who was guilty, and how did the detective find it out? It was Jerry. Ben was hit from the right. It means the person who did it was left-handed. Among the three suspects, that's only Jerry. Hmm, really? Ben and Jerry? I think I need some ice cream. A member of an expedition to the South Pole found himself in a frozen cave. He didn't remember what had happened, but he knew he had to get out. The man saw three doors and a note saying what was behind each of them. Behind the first door, there was a hungry polar bear. Behind the second door, there was a room filled with poisonous gas. And behind the third, there was a room with sharp icicles falling from the ceiling every second. Which door should the man choose to survive? (laughs) 
He should pick the first door. He's at the South Pole. There are no polar bears there. After classes, Nora stayed at the university. She needed to finish her project. She was sitting in the hallway. Soon, she got hungry. The girl went to grab some food and left all her stuff behind. When Nora returned, she checked her things and called the police. She told them what had happened and reported her wallet stolen. There were three other students nearby. All of them were questioned. Kennedy said she had been texting her friends. Ethan said, I did sit close to Nora for a while, but I didn't see or touch her wallet. Gabriella said she had been in the classroom and just walked out a couple minutes before. The detective listened to them and left without arresting anyone. Why? The detective remembered that Nora had gone to get some food. It means the wallet was with her and couldn't be stolen. The girl lied. (laughs) Three women, Sarah, Mila, and Eleanor, went shopping. Two of them are pregnant, and one is a professional watermelon thief. Yeah, I know, but just humor me. Can you tell which one stole the watermelon? It's Mila. She's wearing heels. It's not the kind of shoes pregnant women would wear. Aurora was spending her summer in the countryside. She often took long walks in the forest alone. One day, she saw a huge mansion. It was obvious no one lived there, so she entered the house. It was dusty inside, but still beautiful. Aurora took some pictures and left the place. When the girl came back home, she looked through her photos. She wanted to pick the best ones to post on her social media. But then she saw one of the photos and screamed. Take a careful look at this photo. Can you see what scared her so much? Aurora noticed she, herself, was in the photo. But it's impossible. She was alone in the house. Stella and Adeline were sisters. Their grandmother once presented Adeline a bracelet. But both girls loved this piece of jewelry very much. So sometimes, Stella snuck into her sister's room and borrowed the bracelet. One day, Adeline came home and noticed the bracelet was gone. She knocked on her sister's door. Stella opened the door, realized it was her sister, and shut it again. In a couple of minutes, Adeline managed to break into the room. She started searching for the bracelet. Stella told her that this time, she hadn't taken Adeline's jewelry. Adeline didn't find anything and had to leave. But on her way out, she remembered something and managed to get her bracelet back. Where was it? When Stella opened the door, she had her hair down. But later, she already had her hair tied up. In those few minutes, she made a bun and hid the bracelet in her hair. On a rainy summer night, Mrs. Miller came home after work. Her neighbor, Mrs. Smith, visited her. The women wanted to have some tea together. Mrs. Smith said her daughter was at a party. She met one of Mrs. Miller's triplet sons there. Mrs. Miller asked which one it was, but her friend didn't know. Her daughter could never tell the guys apart. The problem was all three of them were grounded and weren't allowed to go out until the next week. Mrs. Miller wanted to find out who had broken the rules. She called the boys and asked how they'd spent the day. Ian, the artist, said, In the evening, I was outside drawing. Ryan, the musician, said, I spent all day inside writing a new song. Luke, who likes sports, said, I did a workout and spent the rest of the day reading. Mrs. Miller understood which of her sons was lying and grounded him for another month. Who's the liar, and how did she know? Ian lied. He said he had been drawing outside, but it was raining. Another day, another walk in the forest, and Esme got lost again. And still, she managed to find the way to the witch's house. 
This time, the woman had another task for Esme. The witch gave Esme a candy bar and a knife. She was going to perform seven tricks. After each of them, Esme had to give her one-seventh of the bar. But there was a catch. The knife was magical and could only make two cuts. It was also impossible to break the bar or cut it without the knife. How did Esme fulfill these conditions and return home? Esme made two cuts, dividing the bar into the following pieces, 1 7 2 7 and 4 7 After the first trick, she gave the witch the 1 7 piece. After the second one, the girl offered the woman the 2 7 piece and took away the 1 7 After the third trick, she gave the witch the smallest piece back. After the fourth trick, Esme took away the first two pieces and gave the woman the 4 7 piece. Then she gave her the smallest piece again. After the sixth trick, the girl took away the one-seventh and gave the witch the two-seventh piece. And after the last trick, she gave the woman the smallest part of the bar again. Bonus question! Hey, if Esme is so smart, how come she keeps getting trapped in the forest? I have no answer. So Charles found himself locked in a small room. He didn't know what had happened. Just then, he saw a door. He approached it and tried to open it, but it was locked. There were three buttons. On one button, there was a circle. On the second one, a triangle. On the third, a square. Charles didn't know which one would unlock the door. Luckily, though, there was a note. It said 12, 4, 8. Which button should he press to get out? You might have noticed that there's a clock right above the door. It's there for a reason. If you draw lines connecting 12, 4, and 8, you get a triangle. So Charles should press the button with the triangle on it. Esme was having a regular walk in the forest and got lost. She wandered around all night in the dark. Just after sunrise, she came upon a witch's house. She had nowhere else to go, so she walked in and asked the witch to send her home. The witch agreed, but it wasn't going to be that easy. Three magical doors appeared, and Esme had to decide which one to go through. Behind the first door, nothing but a deep pit. Behind the second door was a shower of toxic liquid. Behind the third door was an open space, with a vampire waiting for her. Which way should Esme go? Well, it's already past sunrise. The vampire would be gone already, hiding out somewhere dark. Esme should pick the third door. Maybe Esme could have just jumped over the pit. What do you think? Take a look at these pictures. Which blogger is richer? The second one. Look at the number of likes. She has 17,000, but the first one only has 7,000. One of Mr. Smith's sons, Jaden, was taken. Several hours later, Mr. Smith and his younger son, David, received a letter. The letter stated that if they wanted to see Jaden again, they should round up a million dollars cash and take it to a little shack in the woods. Mr. Smith and David decided to do it, and David took the money into the woods alone. But it didn't go as planned. David said that halfway to the shack, someone approached him from behind, hit him, and stole the money. There was an investigation, and a detective asked David what the robber looked like. David said that he had dark hair and a red hoodie with a black logo on it. The detective immediately figured out who had taken Jaden. Can you? It was David. He said the robber approached him from behind. But somehow, he still managed to remember some pretty specific details about the robber. Nah, he made it all up. Abigail wanted to buy her mom the best birthday present ever. The problem was, she had zero ideas. She decided to sneak into her mom's computer, go to her online shopping cart, and see what she had saved in there. When her mom left for work, Abigail sneaked into her home office and turned on the computer. 
Uh Uh-oh, it required a password, and Abigail didn't know it. There was a sticky note attached to the keyboard. It was a clue. One apple, two apple, two orange, two kiwi, one lemon. Can you guess the password? Each number represents one letter of the word. A apple means the first letter, so A. Then we get P, R, I, and L. The password is April. Wow, her mom is really into fruit. A lady was shopping and left the store right after paying. A couple of minutes later, she returned. She had forgotten her wallet at the checkout counter. But the wallet was already gone. She called the police and reported the robbery. A detective interrogated the people who were in the store at the time. Sophia, the cashier, said she didn't see the wallet after the lady paid. Robert, a pilot who happened to be shopping there, said he didn't even see the wallet. He didn't have his glasses on. Mark, a landscaper, said he was in a different part of the store, so he didn't see anything. So, who stole the wallet? It was Robert, the pilot. He looks pretty blind without his glasses, so he's definitely not a pilot. Why would he lie about that? Unless… Amelia's brother, Neil, was a crazy scientist. In the past year, he had been working on a time machine. One day, he ran into Amelia's room and screamed. He'd done it! He'd invented a time machine, and it totally worked! He said he had already tested it. He managed to talk to William Shakespeare, Princess Diana, and Sherlock Holmes. Amelia didn't believe him at all. Why was she so sure about it? Even if Neil had actually invented a time machine, he'd only have been able to talk to people who actually existed in real life. He said he talked to Sherlock Holmes. That guy's a character from a book and a TV show and a movie. Hey, that guy's everywhere. A woman called the police and reported that she had been robbed. She said she was in a restaurant bathroom fixing her makeup. Someone had come up from behind and hit her on the head, so she didn't know what the person looked like. The police sent her home and refused to fill out the report. Why? The woman was fixing her makeup, so she must have been looking in the mirror. She would have definitely seen someone sneaking up behind her. She lied and made up the whole story. Grab your detective hat and head over to Europe for this next one. Bill was traveling from Paris to Berlin by train. When the train got to Berlin, Bill wasn't on it. His friend reported him missing. The investigation began, and somewhere between Paris and Berlin, they found some interesting clues. There were footsteps that belonged to Bill, and a few feet away, his luggage. A detective found the person who had been sitting next to Bill on the train. His name was Sam. He said that Bill didn't have a ticket. When he saw the ticket inspector coming, he decided to make a run for it. He threw his suitcase off the train and then jumped. The detective didn't believe his story and arrested Sam for pushing Bill off the train. Why? Look at the direction the train was going. If Sam's story was true, the suitcase should be behind Bill's footsteps, not in front. Sam pushed Bill off the train, then threw his luggage off after. Mrs. Anderson came home from work in the middle of the day because she'd forgotten some important documents. When she went to the bedroom, she saw her husband lying on the bed. There was a paramedic beside him. Mr. Anderson was unconscious, and the doctor explained that he had been poisoned. Luckily, he had had time to call a paramedic before passing out. Mrs. Anderson immediately blocked off the door and called the police. She said there was a fake paramedic in her house who had poisoned her husband. How did she know? You might have noticed that when Mrs. Anderson arrived, there was no ambulance in the driveway. That's super suspicious. William was hit on the head and taken away. When he woke up, 
he found himself locked in a small room. He tried to open the door, but obviously it was locked. There was nothing in the room except for a wooden box with 12 bottles in it. There was an extra bottle on the floor next to it. William looked everywhere for the key, but found nothing. After a bit of thinking, he noticed something. He managed to find the key. Where was it? Look at the bottle on the floor. It's exactly the same as the others, but for some reason, it's a bit lower. There must be a fake floor in the box. That's where the key is. Several women went missing in a small city. The police searched for months, but they couldn't find any trace of them. One day, a detective got lucky. He saw a hooded figure who matched their description, followed it, and found the place where they were being kept hostage. But when he busted in, there were just three women. They all said that they had been locked in this small room, but the detective knew that one of them wasn't a victim at all. The first woman said her name was Emery. She had spent around a year in that room. The second woman, Aria, said she had been there about six months. The third woman said her name was Brielle and that she had been locked up in there for about two months. Can you tell who's lying? Emery's lying. Look at her hair. She just had it dyed, but she's been there a year. Aria's hair is also dyed, but you can see her natural dark roots growing out. After years in college, Stephen came back to his hometown. He met up with a couple of his old friends, Dylan and Harry. Both of them said they're successful bloggers now. To prove it, they showed him screenshots from their most popular videos. Steve took a look at them and could tell that one of his friends was lying. Who's lying and how did Steve know? Harry's lying. The number of views for his video is 2.1 million, but the number of likes is way higher, 4.5 million. That's impossible, or at least really, really suspicious. Harry probably photoshopped that screenshot. Uh Uh-huh. Look at these ladies and try to figure out who's not very smart. Even though the first woman looks as if she's about to touch a hot iron, the device is actually unplugged, so she won't hurt herself. The second lady, though, is about to touch a heated waffle maker. Oh no! John's parachute hasn't opened, and he's now plunging toward the ground. Does he have higher chances of survival if he falls into a lake or on a haystack? He should try to fall on a haystack. Do you see crocodiles hiding near the shore of the lake? Uh What do you think is more dangerous in this situation? A bear or a swarm of bees? Look, the bear is about to run after its prey. It won't pay any attention to you. But bees seem to be angry. They'll most likely go after you. Look at these people. Who is most likely to survive? The man hanging over the fire? A woman tied over a barrel filled with toxic liquid? Or this guy swinging over a field of sharp needles? The woman hanging over the barrel with toxic liquid is the one who will survive. Look, there's a hole in the barrel and the liquid is leaking out of it. The woman just needs to wait until the barrel is empty and untie herself. To get out of the locked room, Jeremy had to crack this puzzle. 1 equals 5, 2 equals 15, 3 equals 215, 4 equals 3215, 4 equals 3215, 5 equals… What number is hidden under the question mark? It's 1, 
5 equals 1 because 1 equals 5. But the door of the room still didn't open. Apparently, Jeremy had to solve another riddle. He had to arrange four nines in such a way that they were equal to 100. He could use any math symbols. How can the guy do it? Jeremy figured out the correct answer pretty fast. 99 plus 9 divided by 9 equals 100. You're crossing a railroad bridge when you spot a train coming toward you. The bridge is built over a lake swarming with crocodiles, so jumping into the water is out of the question. How can you survive in this situation? You're farther away from the shore you came from and won't have enough time to get back to that side. So your only option is to run toward the train really fast and turn left or right when you cross the bridge. Jack is taking part in a challenge. He's reached the final stage, which takes place in a desert. If he succeeds now, he'll win $1 million. There are four pots in front of him. In each of them, there's a key. Jack needs to get any key from any pot. But on top of the first pot, there's a bowl filled with a strong acid. The second pot is covered with a bowl full of venomous spiders. In the bowl placed on the third pot, Jack sees a raging fire. A viper is curled up in the bowl covering the fourth pot. Uh -oh. Jack isn't allowed to drop the bowls or turn them over. Which pot should he choose? The guy should choose the third bowl. He can put the fire out with sand. He's in the desert, after all, and get the key. David's company develops apps for smartphones. Right now, he's looking for a designer. He's got hundreds of resumes, but he's chosen just three of them. Angela's resume says, I'm 23 years old, I don't have a lot of experience, but I'm a fast learner and have already designed similar applications. Helen wrote in her resume, I'm 26 and have four years of work experience. You should hire me because I've created lots of TikTok stories that have gone viral. And Eric's resume claims he's 28 years old with seven years of work experience. He's designed tons of apps and he's been working for Google since the company was launched. David can only hire one person, but it's okay because one applicant hasn't lied in their resume. Who is it? Eric has just seven years of work experience, but Google was officially launched in 1998. There are no stories on TikTok, meaning Helen couldn't create them. David hired Angela, even though she hasn't been working for a long time. She's honest and has a nice portfolio. Three friends agreed to hang out together on Friday night. One of them, Brian, was tasked with bringing pizza. But the guy was running extremely late. His friends were starving. Strangely, Brian wasn't picking up their calls. But in an hour or so, he sent them a selfie. In the photo, he was standing next to his car. In the following message, he wrote he had run out of gas. He was at a gas station, tanking his car up. But his friends didn't believe Brian's excuses. Why? In the picture, it's clearly seen that the guy has got an electric car. It doesn't need gas. Mark told his wife he was going on a business trip to Canada and asked her to pack his bag for him. It was winter, so his wife packed a pair of very warm socks, a scarf, and a knitted hat for Mark. When Mark came back, he said that his business trip was successful. Then he asked his wife why she hadn't put his toothbrush and toothpaste in his suitcase. The woman immediately understood that her husband was lying about going on a business trip. How did she figure it out? She put his toothbrush and toothpaste under the scarf, hat, and warm socks. If he didn't take them out of his bag, it probably wasn't very cold outside, which means that, most likely, he was not in Canada. One out of nine identical balls is heavier than the others. 
How can you figure out which one it is after just two weighings? You need to divide all the balls into three groups and weigh two of them. That's how you can figure out which group contains the heavy ball. After that, you should pick two balls from the heaviest group. Weigh one against the other, and you'll understand which ball of the three is the heaviest. There was a blackout in the city, but the bus driver still noticed a dog on the road and managed to stop in time and avoid hitting the animal. How did he do this? This accident happened during the day. You have six glasses standing in a row on the table. The first three of them are filled with water and the other three are empty. You need to move just one glass to arrange them in such a way that full and empty glasses alternate. How can you do it? Just pick up glass number two and pour the water into glass number five. You enter a room and see that there's nothing inside but a blackboard on the wall. There are four words written on it, pin, check, boiling, view. You have to figure out a five letter word that can be added to each of them to make an existing word or word combination. Have you realized that the necessary word is point? Then you'll get pinpoint, checkpoint, boiling point, and viewpoint. Now, you're in a strange building that looks like a planetarium. There are photos of distant stars on the walls. In the middle, there's a screen with a riddle on it. N-E-U-S-R-N-E-R-R-S-T-H. U-S. Question mark. You have to figure out what is hiding under the question mark. If you've realized that the correct answer is RY, congratulations! The list is made up of the last two letters of the names of the planets of the solar system. In the order from Neptune to Mercury, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Earth, Venus, Mercury. Two daughters and two mothers went out to a cafe. Each of them ate a slice of pizza. But strangely, only three slices were eaten. How come? These ladies are a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter. Two of them are moms, and two are daughters. Jason and Stephen are home alone with their kids. Jason is talking to his mother, and Stephen is watching a baseball game on the TV. Who's being negligent? Jason. Although both babies might fall out the window and both dads should watch out, Jason's baby is on the higher floor. Whoops. Mila and Gregor cook dinner for their kids. Which one of them is uh, <clears throat> the most confused? Mila. She accidentally mixed up the plates. She gave the dog her daughter's food and is about to feed her daughter dog food. Yum! Sabrina and her son went to the mountains to spend the day sliding. Adam is barbecuing in the backyard while watching his daughter. Who's not watching their child properly? Sabrina her son is sliding right into a big hole in the ice. Rebecca and Natalie took their kids to the lake. The boys are about to jump from the cliff. Whose child is in danger? Natalie's. There's rocks under the cliff her son is about to jump from. Megan and Rachel were cleaning their kids' rooms. Rachel noticed her son's phone and decided to check it. 
and Rachel found her daughter's diary. Who's in trouble? Rachel. It's bad to read a child's personal things, but she's also going to be busted because her daughter is about to walk into the room. <laughs> Mary and her son are spending time on the beach. Chris and his children are watching a TV. Which parent is doing something wrong? Mary. It's dangerous for anyone to be in the water during thunderstorms. Now we're moving to harder questions. Every correct answer awards two points. Meredith is teaching her daughter to do her makeup. Beverly is teaching her teenager to style her hair. Which mom is doing something wrong? Beverly. The hair straightener isn't plugged in. Nicole and Diana are spending time with their kids. Nicole is reading to her son, and Diana is watching cartoons with her daughter. Who is not behaving wisely? Nicole. She forgot about the food that she's cooking in the oven, and it's burning. So it's going to be takeout tonight. Bradley and Ryan's sons are blamed for painting a face on a neighbor's fence. Both boys denied doing it, and both fathers believe their sons. Who's been misled? Ryan. His son still has green paint on his hands that he couldn't properly wash off. Jennifer went for a walk with her son, but she got distracted talking on the phone. Mark left his daughter in a closed car while he entered a store to buy garden tools. Who has made a bigger mistake? Mark. It's dangerous to leave people or animals in a closed car, especially in the heat when the car warms up very fast and there's a lack of fresh air inside. Brian is teaching his teen son how to drive. And Nancy is cooking a dinner with her daughter. Who isn't being wise? Brian. Nancy's daughter seems to be old enough to cut an apple, especially under supervision. But Brian can't control all of his son's actions in the car. Martha and her son went to the jungle, and she stopped to take some selfies. Peter took his son camping, and he's setting up the tent while his son is trying to light a fire. Who's not being smart? Martha. Her baby is approaching a snake that can be venomous. Melissa and Stephanie are doing chores. Melissa is handling the laundry, and Stephanie is cleaning the kitchen. Who should be more careful? Stephanie. Her daughter put her cell phone in a dishwasher. Tiffany and Michael's sons came back home after a study evening at their friend's house. Neither parents are suspicious. However, someone's son wasn't studying tonight. Who overlooked a party guy? <music> Tiffany. Her son has a lipstick stain on his collar. Jack and Vivian took their kids to school. Now Jack is walking to work, and Vivian is driving to a store. Who forgot something? Jack. He's still wearing his daughter's pink school backpack. Looking good, Jack! Charles and Penelope cooked breakfast for their kids. Which parent probably didn't get much sleep the previous night?
Penelope. She gave her daughter a raw potato and didn't even peel it. Sandra is doing gardening with her daughter. George is watching his child swimming in a pool. Who's being stupid? George. He fell asleep and left his son in the pool unsupervised. What's more, the boy took off his armbands and can drown. Uh Uh-oh. Elizabeth and John's daughters came home. They said they were doing a group science project, and both parents believed their daughters. Who didn't detect a lie? John. His daughter is wearing a sweater on a hot day, so she could be hiding something. Jessica and Aaron cooked a dinner for their families. Jessica cooked Thai soup, and Aaron made mashed potatoes. Who is a bad cook? Jessica. Her daughter poured her soup in a flower pot. Travis didn't let his daughter go to her friend's birthday party and told her to do her homework all day. Christina's son had to spend the day in his bedroom, too, instead of going to the movies. When the teenagers came down to dinner at 7 o'clock, which parent didn't notice they're being lied to? Travis. It's raining, and his daughter has wet hair. It means she was outside and not sitting in her bedroom. And finally, the hardest questions for three points each. Dustin is cooking dinner with his daughter. Joseph is mowing the lawn while his child is playing nearby. Who isn't smart? Joseph. Lawnmowers are very dangerous machines and should never be used if there are kids around. Sean is teaching his little son how to chop wood. Camilla is listening to music and washing the dishes while her baby is sleeping upstairs. Who's making a mistake? Camilla. The music is too loud, and she won't hear if her son wakes up and cries. Brandon and Daniel are watching their kids playing in the backyard. Who's not being wise? Daniel. His son is playing in the sunshine without a hat on and might get sunstroke. Pamela is getting ready for the meeting with her son's teacher at 12 o'clock. William is driving his son to a birthday party. Who isn't very attentive? Pamela. She must have confused the time. The meeting was at 12 o'clock, but it's already 1.30. Thomas is reading a newspaper while watching his son. Molly is talking on the phone while dinner is cooking in the oven. Who should rethink their actions? Molly. She forgot to turn on the oven. Samantha and Bob are sending their kids on a school field trip. Which of the parents forgot to do something? Bob. Why is he holding his son's lunch? The kid is not eating today. You wake up in a room with no windows or doors. The ceiling is extremely high, and the only way out is a closed hatch at the very top. Suddenly, the room starts filling with water. You've checked everywhere. There's no way to turn it off. You know that help is on the way, but they won't be here for at least five minutes. You're pretty sure the entire room will be flooded in two. You definitely can't hold your breath for that long. You look around and find three objects, a straw, some rope, and a bucket. Only one of them can actually save you in this situation. Which one should you choose, and how is it going to help?
you should take the bucket. Flip it over and put your head inside when the water gets to head height. You'll have your very own small air pocket to help you breathe until help arrives. Uh Uh-oh, you're in a building that just caught on fire. You need to escape, but the fire just keeps spreading and spreading. You're feeling dizzy, and the smoke is making it hard to see. And the heat? It's insane! Suddenly, you see three paths that lead outside, but it's not going to be so simple. There's no fire near the first exit, but it's on the opposite side of the burning room. The second exit is right in front of you, but the upper part is completely covered in flames. The final exit is through the kitchen. There's shattered glass everywhere, but the flames are barely touching it, and the door is wide open. Which exit should you take? Even though the first exit isn't on fire, an indoor blaze is totally unpredictable. Flames can pop up out of nowhere. Going through a kitchen is never a good idea in a fire. There might be exposed gas lines in there. Your best bet is to go for the closest path and crawl your way to safety. Well, you're stranded in the middle of a desert and are in desperate need of water. You crawl along, trying to find any source to hydrate yourself. As nighttime rolls around, the wind gets stronger and it starts to get cold. You sit down next to a tree. How are you going to find water in the middle of a desert? Grab two of the largest tree branches you can find, and then rip your outer shirt and stretch it out over them, kind of like a sail. Shove the two branches into the sand to anchor them. The water in the atmosphere will get caught on the cloth and drip down for you to collect. Well, you're tied up on some railroad tracks and can't wriggle free. There's a train heading your way, and it doesn't look like it's stopping. Oh well, if you stretch your arms out, you can just reach a lighter, a small pocket razor, and a can of oil. Which can you use to escape? Pour the oil on the ropes holding you down. It'll act as a lubricant, and you'll be able to wriggle free. Taylor finished another awesome ice fishing session. He packed up his gear and walked back home with his dinner. Halfway back to the car, he realized he was being followed by a hungry cougar. It started chasing him. Taylor was so close to his car, but the cougar was gaining on him. What should he do? He should fling the fish to the side to distract the cougar. Then he should ditch all his gear. It's just slowing him down. That way, he's got a chance of making it to the car before he turns into cougar chow. Well, you find yourself in a pitch black room. The room is huge, and there are many hallways and corridors leading to unknown places. You need to find your way out before the room starts heating up like an oven. You only have two minutes. You can feel some pipes on the wall, but nothing else. How can you save yourself? When the pipes start heating up, they'll probably turn red. It'll already be super hot by then but you'll have just enough time to figure out the layout of the room and find a way to escape. Angela decided to go for a nice walk in the forest. Mm -hmm. About an hour in, she tripped and spilled all her water. No problem. Right in front of her was a tiny lake, and close by, a small stream and a cactus. Which one should you use to get herself a refreshing drink of water? she should head for the stream. That lake isn't moving. That means it probably has bacteria living in it. And a single cactus won't have enough water to quench your thirst. Even though the stream is pretty small, moving water is almost always the safest option. What are those things? Oh, paw prints! Those are bear tracks heading to the forest, a wolf print coming out of the forest, and some elk prints heading toward a lake. Well, what's the best place to go if you're not into the whole being eaten thing? Think fast! The bear going into the forest probably scared that large dog off. Oh, you thought those were wolf prints? Mm, Not likely. Wolves mostly travel in packs. The bear is most likely chasing the elk, so they'll both end up at the lake. That means the forest's safe for now. You're stuck in a well in a small village, and the water's already up to your knees. There's a rope leading to the mouth of the well, but it's definitely not strong enough to hold you. You look around and find a bucket, some clothing, and a lighter. How do you escape?
Shove the clothes in the bucket, tie the bucket to the rope, and light the clothes on fire. Then quickly hoist the bucket up. Chances are, in such a small village, someone will see the smoke and run over to help you. Kate finished her morning hike and decided it was time to go home. She saw a vintage jeep parked by the hiking path. While she was admiring it, a huge grizzly appeared in front of her. The bear didn't seem that interested in her, for now, but that could change any second. There was a large screwdriver on the floor by the jeep. What can she do to make sure the bear won't be interested in her? She can puncture the gas tank with the screwdriver and douse herself in gasoline. That way, the bear wouldn't be so interested in her scent. Eric was out camping and he needed some light to see in the dark. He reached into his tent, but his flashlight wasn't working for some reason, and his phone only had 10% battery. He looked around and saw a bottle of water, an empty sandwich bag, his hiking boots, and a pillow. What can he do to make more light? He can take his phone and put it right next to the water bottle. The water inside the bottle will diffuse the light, making it much brighter. Adrian and Jack went rock climbing all day, then realized it was time to head home. After a long walk through the woods trying to get to their car, they realized they were totally lost. They'd never been in these woods before. They didn't have a clue what to do. What's worse, Jack collapsed from exhaustion and couldn't take another step. Adrian tried to lift him up, but Jack was too heavy. Night was approaching. He tried to call for help, but neither phone had any signal. His only choice was to venture out and seek help. He checked both gear bags and found a small pick hammer, some ropes, some sturdy locks, and a harness. What should he do? Adrian should put on the harness and tie all the ropes together to make one huge long one. Then he should tie one end to Jack and one end to his harness. That way, if he got lost in the woods, he'd be able to find his way back to Jack. That's one long rope. Nora's family was out for the day, and she was going to surprise them all with a triple chocolate raspberry cake. Right after plugging in her mixer, she heard a small pop, a fizz, then the electricity shorted out, and her precious mixer broke out in flames. Her phone was in the other room. Quick, help her! She's got to stop the flames from getting worse while she sprints over to get her phone and call for help. What should she do? She could take some flour and dump it all over the mixer. It'll tame the fire and buy her enough time to call for help. Roy went out for a small walk in the forest right behind his house. He was having a great time, chucking stones at trees and thump. He launched the stone right into a beehive. A swarm of bees flew out and started chasing him. His house was pretty far away by this point, and there were tons of bushes and shrubs in his way. There was a huge open field in front of him with a deep lake in the middle. Where should he go to escape the angry bees? Jumping into the water to escape from a swarm of bees doesn't work. They'll just wait right above you and sting you when you resurface to breathe. The trick is to run as far away as you can, head for the house, and shut the door, Roy. There was once a magical forest inhabited by elves and gnomes. Since they didn't get along very well, they lived in two different parts of the forest to avoid all conflict. One day, centaurs invaded the forest, and elves and gnomes were forced out, running in different directions. Let's follow a small group of six creatures, three elves and three gnomes. They ran west, but unfortunately, they stumbled across a lake. None of them could swim, but luckily, there was a raft. The raft could only carry two creatures at once two elves, two gnomes, or one elf and one gnome. So you need to figure out a way for all of them to cross the lake safely. Now, here's the problem. If there are more gnomes on one side than elves, they will attack them. Even if an elf is on the raft, but not in the part of the lake where there are more gnomes than elves, it's still not safe. Can you figure out a way for them all to cross the lake safely? Okay, so here are five possible first steps. One elf crosses the lake, or one gnome, or two elves, two gnomes, or one elf and one gnome. But it doesn't make any sense to cross the lake alone, since they need to send the raft back somehow. So those two options are out. 
two elves can't cross the lake together because then the third elf will be left alone with three gnomes and they will attack him. So it's either two gnomes crossing the lake first or an elf and a gnome. So let's go with the two gnomes. So two of them cross the lake and, of course, one of them has to come back. Now what? Two elves can't leave together because the third one is in danger. If an elf and a gnome leave together, then the one who is leaving will be in danger as soon as they cross the river. So two more gnomes leave together, and then one comes back. An elf and a gnome can't leave together because then there will be three gnomes and one elf on the other side. So this time, two elves cross the lake together. Who comes back? Not an elf, because the other one can't be left alone there. A gnome can't go back alone. Otherwise, there will be two gnomes and one elf on the first shore. So, a plot twist. An elf and a gnome come back together. Now, two gnomes can't cross the lake. An elf and a gnome can't go either. So, the two remaining elves go to the other shore together. None of them can now return since there are two gnomes left on that shore. So, a gnome will return to pick up one of his buddies. Then another gnome will go to pick up the last gnome. But it's not the only solution. You could also succeed by sending a gnome and an elf together as a first move. Here's a graph of how it would play out. But remember, no matter how far you travel, there's no place like gnome. Okay, great job! Now it's time for the second riddle, and this one comes from Esme. This girl often goes for a walk in a forest and typically gets lost. This time, though, she doesn't get lost. Here's her way home, but she's tempted to go visit her old friend, a witch, who lives in that forest. Esme has an amazing <laughs> riddle, and it's pretty hard, so she thinks she has a good chance of winning the witch's cat. So, Esme goes to the witch's house and offers the following. I bet you can't solve my riddle. If I'm right, your cat will go home with me. The witch believes she can solve any riddle, so she takes that risk. Esme puts a big, acute triangle on the table. Here, you can make seven cuts to make this triangle disappear. Every piece you cut off that is an acute triangle will disappear. But if a triangle has an angle that is right or obtuse, that piece will stay. Once again, seven cuts, and you have to make the whole triangle disappear. Not a single smallest piece can be left. So, how can the witch do that and keep her cat? Whenever you make a cut, it'll either produce two right angles or an acute and obtuse angle. The witch seems to be doomed, but then she looks at the pizza she hasn't finished. When you cut into more than four pieces, all angles are acute. The problem is that a pizza is round, and we're dealing with a triangle. Still, the trick also works with other shapes, like hexagons and pentagons. Good for the witch, she can make a pentagon out of this acute triangle by making just two cuts. The small cut-off triangles are acute, and they disappear. Now, the witch needs to deal with the pentagon like she does with a pizza. Cut it into five pieces using the last five cuts. That's a success story. Hey, we know you like the cat, Esme, but maybe get one of your own. Okay, do you think you can crack another one? I promise it's the last one for today, and it's quite fun. No more geometry. Here's how the story goes. A thousand years ago, six siblings founded a magical school. Ingram, Regalia, and Corona are witches, and Agnard, Ardumo, and Modnar are wizards. A pair of siblings found a house each, and the names of those houses are Rymeth, Madlow, and Demora. All six of them also founded the fourth house, named after their seventh sibling, who went missing when they were young. You are invited to study in the magical school. But as you arrive, you have to be sorted into your house. You have to put your hand on the sorting book and wait for its decision to light up on the cover. When you do it, the book sees potential in you. So instead of sorting you into one of the three houses right away, it gives you an opportunity to get into the fourth house, where the most gifted young magicians go. To prove that you're good enough to be sorted into that house, you have to solve the sorting riddle. 
The task is to guess the name of the special house, which no one but its students knows. But you have some guidelines that can serve as hints. First, you have to find out who founded which house. Here are some statements. Every house was founded by a brother and a sister. Corona and Regula found Rymouth and Madlow, but not necessarily in this order. Ingram and Ardumo founded Madlow and Damora, but not necessarily in this order. Agnard and Regala founded the same house. Now, after you figure it out, the next step is to guess the name of the secret house. To find it out, find what all siblings have in common. So, are you gifted enough to get sorted into that special house? First, you have to find out who founded which house. So, the pair is always a brother and sister. Let's look at conditions 2 and 3. Each of them mention mad love. Both Corona and Regala are sisters, which means that no matter who founded Madlow, it already has a sister founder. Therefore, Ingram, who is also a witch, couldn't have founded this house. Which means that Madlow was founded by Ardumo, so Ingram founded Damora. Agnard founded the same house with Regala, so it was Modnor who founded Damora with Ingram. Therefore, it only leaves us with Rymouth for Agnar and Regala. Finally, Corona founded Madlow. Okay, great. Now we have to figure out the name of the fifth house. What do the siblings have in common? Of course, all of them have the letter R in their names. Let's put them in the order of appearance of the letter in their names, starting with Regala. Under each of their names, let's put the name of the house they founded. Now, the respective letters under each R form the name Radota. That's the name of their missing sister, and that's what the fourth house is called. 